I would like to review a little bit what we discussed in the last lecture and to compare between low pressure CVD and atmospheric pressure CVD. First is the pressure, uh, atmospheric pressure, uh, APCVD or atmospheric pressure CVD is done in one atmosphere. Low pressure CVD typical value is about one thousandth of an atmosphere in the range of one millitor. Typical processes in low pressure CVD are about one millitor, point one millitor, uh, 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 so, uh, up to one tor. So it can be this is this is one thousandth of an atmosphere, but but we can actually make it lower. We can actually make it some cases even one hundredth or one thousandth of this value. If you look at the boundary layer, the boundary layer is about 3 to 10 times thicker, but the diffusivity is thousands times faster. So because the diffusivity is thousand times faster, we got the Sarfen reaction that is dominates the growth at low temperature. And typically is a complex. What's happened, you have the transport of the species to the surface. This is the blue. Going to the surface, we have some adhesion. And then the molecules start to diffuse in the surface. Not necessarily, but usually they do, because it's high temperature. But the temperature is high, but not too high. And therefore, we have diffusion only on the surface. There is no diffusion into the surface, into the bulk. Temperature is not too high. Some cases, we can have desorption of the precursor. If not, we have nucleation in islands and reaction. And then we can have also emission of the reaction products. Typical reaction rates behave, this is, in this curve, we can see the deposition rate versus 1 over temperature. The deposition rate is typically given in a log scale. So if we go to low temperature, we can see the deposition rate. And what we see, what we present here, is the deposition rate of four different gases, but they're all based on similar chemistry. This is silen, SiH4, is the fastest, is the gas which with the highest reaction rate. And this is dichlorosilen, SiH2, chlor2. This is SiH, chlor3. And this is Si, chlor4. What you can see, all these reactions at low temperature following exponential dependence, which means they have similar mechanisms of reaction, and they all depend on the surface reaction. R is the deposition rate. And at low temperature, R is proportional to E minus delta E over KT. This is the classical Arrhenius dependence of a chemical reaction. What happens at higher temperature, we start to be limited by diffusion. And you can see, by the way, surpri not surprisingly, but the gas with the slowest deposition rate, actually this uh, turning point when we switch from surface reaction mode to diffusion reaction mode, is it occurs at higher temperature. So this, uh, by the way, all these materials are depositing silicon. So these are all can be used to deposit silicon. Typically, SiH4 is used for polysilicon. And typically, Si chlorine 4 is used for epitaxy of silicon. Uh, what else? So, if we look at this curve, if we plot at the growth rate versus the gas flow rate, if you take it in the previous chamber, in the previous, sorry, in the previous system, I showed you, in the previous slide, I showed you the position rate versus 1 over T under given condition. For a given system, with a given volume, with a given flow rate. But let's see what happens when we change the flow rate in a given system. If we change the flow rate, of course, when the, go when the flow rate is zero, there is no deposition. I mean, maybe initially we'll have some deposition, but then there is no more fresh gases coming, so deposition will practically will go, will be very low. Now, if we plot the growth rate, versus square root of the gas flow, usually we get a straight line. And the reason is it low gas flow, 
we don't have enough gas in the system, so we are limited by the transport of this mass to the surface. Because we have the reaction rate in the surface, and the gas is coming, but the gas is coming too slowly. So we are limited in the transport in the gas phase. If you remember, the, trans the, the transition, the, trans the, 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 the transport from the gas phase to the surface depends on the boundary layer thickness and the diffusivity. And the boundary layer thickness depends on the square root of the velocity of the air. And this is typical to many reactors that the, the position rate is proportional to the square root of the gas flow. When you flow the gas faster, the gas is flowing faster in the chamber. The deposition rate is going faster because we, have a, we are modifying. We have, first, we, we have more gas in the system, and we change the, the, the boundary layer thickness. And then overall, the growth rate goes like this. You, if you remember here, we depend on this factor, which we call Hg. Hg, which is the... Uh, I need the, excuse me, so remember we have two factors, one is Ks, which is the factor which describes the, the, the flux to the surface, which was function of the concentration of the gas near the surface. And the second one was Hg, the transfer function, the transport function, which was depend, which if you take the flux was also depends on the transport from the gas phase, which, uh, uh, which is the function of a constant, and Hg was equal to diffusivity divided by the boundary layer thickness. So if we increase the flux, the flow of the gas in the system, Hg is going up, we have more gas, and also this F is going up because now the concentration of the gas in the system is increasing. And what happens, at certain point, we reach a situation where the surface reaction rate becomes, because the surface reaction rate is constant, but, the, but there's more and more gas in the system until we reach a situation that the gas phase reaction the, 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 the gas reaction and the interface between the solid and the gas becomes dominant. So here we switch for, for a mass transport limited range to a surface reaction limited range. This is typical. And usually we work in this regime. Usually you increase the flux of the, fl the flow of the gas in the system by, uh, uh, until you reach the state when you are limited by the surface reaction. Yes. while keeping the same pressure in the system. Uh, I uh, assume here that I work with a pump that is pumping to a certain pressure. I, I, you can change if I, I, I'm not teach in this class, I'm, used, I'm describing some ideal systems. You have a pump. The pump is pumping the gas. And you can change the speed of the pump. And you can control the pump and the pressure by some means that, that you can co pump faster, but still stay with the same pressure. And you, com you can do it, for example, let's say you pump faster, uh, you increase the speed. Uh, if you increase the speed, if you increase the, sp the, the, sp the pumping speed and the system is constant, then of course you change the pressure. But you can also change some parameters of the system. You can, for example, you can pump your gases and inject some nitrogen to the pump. So the overall pumping is the system. Everything is the same, but the amount you pump from the system is lower. If you, if you want, every two years I give a class about pumping systems and vacuum systems. You are more than welcome. I can give you my lectures. But you are right. By changing the pumping speed, normally I change the pressure. But, but this is some ideal system. So the growth initially we have some islands on the surface, and we have nucleation sites. And then we have some, the nuclei are grow, growing and growing and growing until they merge, and we have co what we call coalescence. 
The co coalescence is when the grains, the small nuclei, are merging together and gen generate a uniform film. And this coalescence can generate some very interesting st structures. The coalescence can, we can get some random grains in the structure. The grains can be columnar, like needles. But once initially, they all form from a nuclei, so the major, the way we describe the growth of the thin film is by a process that we call nucleation and growth. Initially we have nucleation, and then all the nuclei meet, and then we have growth. So it's a kind of, a, the ideal description is a two-step process. Very important parameter in microelectronics is what we call surface coverage. Surface coverage is when you have a surface, and the surface can be, for example, this is a substrate, and we are depositing the film of the substrate. And when we deposit the film of the substrate, the atoms are coming from the volume, they are being deposited on the surface, and they react on the surface. We can have, for example, what we call line of sight deposition. If the atoms are coming from the surface, from the, the, we are, uh, we have, the system is in, in a vacuum, for example. This is our substrate, and there's a step here. The, 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 we have such high vacuum in the system, so the molecules are coming. And if the molecules are coming in this direction only, we have a very directional transport. Let's say we have an ideal system. The molecules arriving from the vacuum to the surface only in 90 degrees. Don't ask me why. Somehow I managed to do it. I spend a lot of money and build such a system. Then the step coverage will be like this. We call it line of sight on non-conformal coating. If the molecules are reacting all over the surface, then we have a conformal coating. And usually we, can ha usually we have something in between. Because so far in the previous lectures, in last week I described only the position on a flat surface. But let's say we have a structure. Let's say we have a structure made of, uh, let's say, SiO2. In this SiO2, I etch a very deep trench. The bottom of the trench is, let's say, nickel silicide. And this is a connector. This is a way to make a contact to, a, let's say, to N plus silicon. This is nickel silicide. And this is a contact to N type silicon. And I would like to deposit tungsten inside. So the main process, and I showed you in the last lecture, the way to deposit tungsten is to flow WF6 in the system, and when we react it, when we increase the temperature, molecules of WF6 are being deposed, are, they are being transferred by diffusion into the surface here, surface here, surface here, and then reach the surface, they adsorb to the surface, they diffuse on the surface, they react on the surface, and we have fluorine two gas coming out, and tungsten staying here. We have a transport from the, from the volume of WF6 to the surface here, and we have it here, and slowly we have deposition of tungsten layer by layer by layer. But you can guess or assume that since the molecule are diffused are diffusing. The molecules diffuse through the volume to the surface or through this structure to the bottom, it's more difficult to reach the bottom than to reach this place. So I would like to work in a surface reaction limited mode. So the deposition here and here and here and here will be the same. But naturally inside the, the trench the deposition rate will be, will be slightly slower because the deposition rate depends, and I will go a few lectures before. So I will run fast, go to this slide. Deposition rate
the deposition rate depends on H, Hg times Ks divided by Hg plus Ks. Ks is independent of the geometry. Ks is the uh, constant we describe the reaction on the surface. But Hg describes the transport of the gas from the volume to the surface. And it's more difficult to diffuse to this point because from here to here, the transport is over a longer distance. So Hg from here to here is slightly, or Hg in this point is different than Hg here. And it's actually the position rate here is slightly slower slightly slower. And this can cause sometimes very interesting problem. And it's a problem of step coverage because we have tried to, let's magnify it. Let's magnify it. And this is, your, this is the substrate. And we start to deposit tungsten. So the first layer of tungsten is almost the same. A little thinner in the bottom, because here the deposition rate is slightly lower. Then the next layer. Now, if we do it in very good vacuum, we are now following the, fo we, are, we are now expecting the following problem. The gas, the molecules are coming to the surface, they can come from here, they can come from here, they can come from here. So the deposition rate in this point, in this point, depends on the angle, the special angle. We are collecting molecules coming here. We are collecting molecules coming from uh, 2 pi degrees, from a larger, from some uh, uh, special angle. Molecules here, I'm collecting from molecules coming from here. Molecules here, actually, we are collecting uh, from here, from here, and also from the side. So now it depends on how we collect the molecule in every point. And here the deposition rate is slightly lower. But I would like to work under condition that we are not so much limited by the transport by the surface reaction rate. So if, if, I, if I work in a temperature which is low enough that I'm limited only by the surface reaction rate, I will end up and I, I will end up right before the closure, I will have in the center because the material is growing from the sides and the material is growing from here and I will have here what we call a seam. Seam. It's like a very thin defect inside the center and when I finish the deposition I will cover everything and if you look, if you take very, if you take contacts of modern devices and you look very carefully in high resolution microscopy you will always see this little defect in the center when the deposition is very conformal, like what I showed you before. Let's move on. Run, 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 run faster to here. If the deposition is conformal, then we got deposition from the side, from the top, and from the sides. And as we deposit more and more material, we will end up in a situation that the, this front and this front, they meet in the center, and we'll have something like a seam, like a very, very narrow defect. So this is what we see, for example. Let's say this, uh, this uh, is the, your structure. And if the deposition is uniform, we typically, this is the metal deposition. If the deposition is uniform, we call it the uniform deposition. If the deposition is not uniform, for example, uh, the flux, we are slightly limited. We depend on the flux of the molecules from the, from the we have some transport uh, issues. We have less deposition on the sides here than here, because here we, we are collecting, in th at this point, we are collecting molecules from 2 pi degrees. But here, we are collecting molecules for a much lower angle. That's what the deposition rate is lower. And this is typical when we are limited by some, when we work at a relatively higher temperature, when we start to be limited by the transport from the, from the, uh, from the gas. 
However, at higher temperature, we start to get another effect, which is surface diffusion. And the surface diffusion becomes faster, which usually slows down the formation of this narrow neck here. Now, if we deal with a very small contact, this is a contact, if we have good deposition, usually it will look like this. However, uh, it's also possible if we have a metal and a metal and we deposit the oxide and the oxide grows from the two sides and with the position and, and the growth rate upwards is much faster than, growth, than the growth sideways. Imagine that you have the following situation that you, are, you have a contact like this and the deposition rate on the top is much faster than the deposition in the bottom. So the deposition here is faster than here. So what happens, the angle here is becoming smaller and smaller and smaller as you deposit more and more. And then what happens at a certain point, you will, fin you will kind of close the gap here and you stay here with a defect, like a hole, a void like a hole in the center. This is called a void. And this happens when you have the position from the sidewards, which is uh, faster than the position onwards inside here. And as we go up, the deposition rate becomes faster. Because this is a situation when we are not, we have Ks and we have Hg, but Hg is not is not negligible. We have to take into consideration some transport. So this is, for example, a situation when we have a void. Now, if we have a very serious transport, uh, transport um, mass transport problems, you can even have such a situation that you deposit very thick layer on the top and very thin layer on the bottom because the bottom is too far away, so the diffusion takes too long. Yes, question. Yes. Where is the seam? Uh, in these figures, uh, most probably, a seam will be developed here. Most probably. Uh, I'm not giving a seam. You can have seam at all temperatures. Depends how bad is the seam. If it's, if it's just a very thin seam that you barely see it, or it's a real void that looks like this. This will be at higher temperature, and this is typically oxide on metal. Metal on oxide, you will have these step coverage problems, and typically you will see seam more in metals and void more in oxides. But this is just from my own experience. In all of these processes, when you have conformal deposition, at the end, when you close the gap, you will have some sort of a defect, either a seam, which is you barely see it, or a void. Yes? He said that the void can happen uh, when the Hg is not negligible. Yes. Could it also happen when the Cs is not constant? Let's say if you have silicon and the um, crystal formation is different in every um, axis of Theoretically, yes, but usually it doesn't happen. You walk usually at the same temperature, and the formation is quite uniform. Now, this is how, this is how it actually looks. This is a deposition of this. This is a metal. What you see here, the black one is a metal. And the metal is covered with some sort of passivation. So this is a, a metallization. This is a line. And what you see is a line which going, the line is going in this direction, and this is a special way to take images of a line that when you take a wafer and you cut it, and usually the cut is being done by focused ion beam, which is like a scissor, you're like cutting the wafer, and what you see here, there was a metal line going from here to here into the, into the, into the wall. And this was a metal, the black one, which, which was covered by uh, some sort of passivation, this light color cover. And on top of it, uh, oxide was deposited. It deposited, 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 and then there, there is a void here. Now, this is an oxide. And what you can see, this is a small space. 
and there's a void. This is the same space, there's a void. Here, is the, here the space is much larger, and there is no void. Because when the, when the void is formed only when the trench is very narrow, so they, you have here what we call necking. The two fronts, are, and they meet. But if the void is very far apart, then it will grow before the formation of the void. So the formation of a void or a seam depends on the geometry <coughs> of the structure. How this connects to what I, taught, what I taught you in the last week? In the last week, I described only surface which is one-dimensional. And I assumed the diffusion is one-dimensional. In this structure, the diffusion is two-dimensional. And in order to understand it, you have to solve the diffusion equation in the gas phase, which is, as you know, it's dc over dt equal d. You really have to solve the diffusion equation in the gas phase. In, the, in one dimensional, we assume that the flux is equal to hg times cg minus cs. So we assume the one dimensional approximation. But this is not correct inside trenches and inside voids, because inside trenches and voids, I really have to solve the two-dimensional, and in some cases, three-dimensional diffusion equation. I cannot make such easy assumptions. This was an assumption, and the situation is more complicated. But still, you have two effects. One effect is transport in the gas phase, and the second effect is the reaction on the surface. And if the surface reaction is dominant, you have conformal deposition. If the gas transport is dominant, we are limited by diffusion. And by the way, if you, this is another picture. This is an oxide, and this is the position of metal. And here you can have, because here the, the flux of the atoms to the surface was lower, and we got less deposition here on the sides. Now, CVD reactors, as I told you in the last week, they transport the direct and, the, and, and the, the gas to the chamber, provide heat to the site of the reaction, remove the byproducts, perform this function with good thickness and composition uniformity with a minimum of physical and chemical contamination. And the production system must also have high throughput and economy and be safe and easy to operate. Classify according to pressure, atmospheric, and also by temperature. And, uh, okay, we are here now. High temperature APCBD reactors for silicon deposition. Silicon deposition is endothermic, so the reactors are what we call cold wall, and they deposit on the hot surface. So this is one chamber, this is another chamber, this is, this is a system which is called like a bell jar. It's like a, you know what's a jar? Like, this is called a bell-shaped jar, and you have uh, the, the wafers are on the sides, or the wafers can be in this. So these are typical pictures for systems which are commercially available. And as you can see, the wafers can be, uh, you have the, fl in every system, the wafers can be vertical or horizontal or in some slope, or the air can flow in this dimension or in this dimension. So, uh, people are still not, uh, still, if, if you buy systems from different companies, you, f you can find different geometries, because there's no one geometry which is the best. It depends on many applications. How do you heat the substrate? For example, one way is to use RF heating. You, uh, you put the wafer on, a, on graphite, and you apply some radio frequency, uh, uh, you apply some electric field in radio frequency, and you heat up the graphite. A pedestal reactor, it's a single substrate heater, so you usually you put the wafer on the pedestal. Pedestal is like what you put statues on, on it, and then you can heat the substrate. Horizontal reactors typically use a susceptor. Susceptor is this device that you put the wafers on, on it. It's like a holder, and it's usually tilted a little bit, to increase the gas velocity downstream and thus decrease the resistance to mass transfer. That's why we got better deposition. And we have also what we call barrel. They look like a barrel that you put away for side by side. So we have versus 
system. In the gallium arsenide, for example, if I will increase a little bit the scope of this class, not always talking about silicon, this is a high temperature APCVD reactor for gallium arsenide. You grow it by CVD and by, uh, is often performing in a chlorine in a chloride transport, like HCl reacts with gallium to form a volatile gallium chloride, which is transported to the substrate, and then you flow arsine, which is extremely toxic gas, but if you are working in safe condition, this is decomposed to as AS4 and AS2, and then gallium chloride reacts with arsine, forming gallium arsenide. And the result is HCl, the byproduct is HCl, which is going out of the chamber. So if you flow arsine, HSH3, H H S H and hydrogen, plus HCl to the chamber, and you put here a, a gallium source inside, what happens, the gas flow over the gallium, forming the gallium chloride, and then it reacts with the arsine, and you deposit gallium arsenide over here on the substrate. This was a system that was used quite a long time ago, but this is a possibility to show you how, uh, what are the problems in the system. This is a complicated system where you flow the gases, but not, some of the gases are in the gas phase. This gallium source, gallium is typically uh, in room temperature below, I don't remember the, what, the exact temperature, but in room temperature it's almost liquid if you boil it about 30 or I don't remember the exact temperature, but in f more than 40 degrees, it's already a liquid. Gallium is a metal, but it's in a, if you heat it a little bit, it becomes liquid. Then you, it reacts, and you get the, the, this deposition. Then you have high temperature LPCVD. This is like the a very common system that deposit uh, material on silicon. And in this system, you can sometimes can put... 10, 20, 30, 40, 100 wafers in the same time on the same system. And this system is the furnace type system that usually have a horizontal tube. In this horizontal tube, you put a holder and you put the wafers on the holder. And the holder is typically a cantilever type, which means you, if this is the tube, you just put like a holder and you put the wafer on the holder and you insert it into the chamber and then you lock the chamber. Put, you close the chamber. And you can put a lot of wafers in the same time. The separation, the wafer spacing is between 3 to 5 millimeters, so they're very close. It's a low pressure operation, removes many of the restraints of reactor design because if you work at very low pressure, the problem with gas, with gas transport are minimized. We are working in, in a very low pressure, so we are working in a surface reaction rate limited conditions. And the main problem is optimi optimization of temperature profile, because when we work under these conditions, we depend on the temperature. So if this wafer is closer to the enter, it's colder than this wafer, then the position right here will be faster. So the main problem in this type of architecture is how to get a very, very a uniform temperature over very large distances. Some of these tubes can be two or three meters long because you put a lot of wafers. Uh, this was a kind of very old design, but still some systems are using it. In some newer systems, they build it exactly like this, but instead putting it vertically, they put it, uh, instead of putting horizontally, they put it vertically. So the wafers are standing like this. Then it's, they claim it's easier to control the temperature. Now, how do you heat the wafer? Simply put here heater, just heater, regular heater, and just heat the wafer. And the tube itself is made either from, from quartz or be even better of silicon carbide, which is very clean and you can buy them and are not so cheap and not so, uh, so easy to clean, it's, uh, it's possible, but it's, it's not cheap. So this is a wafer loading system. This is a classical. When you go to a company, this is a kind of a typical CVD system. Now, before I continue, 
I would say what I showed you so far is typical chemical vapor deposition that you put the gas inside and you have some reaction. Now, if you want to accelerate it, you need to induce some energy. And the most common way to increase CVD is by applying plasma. For example, if you take the wafer, and what you see here, the red one is the holder of the wafer, and this gray are, these gray features are the wafers. And you put the gas into the chamber, and you can have some CVD. If you heat, if you heat it to 3, 4, 500 degrees Celsius. But let's say I would like to deposit at 200 or 250 for some reasons. For example, I want to deposit on aluminum. I want to deposit on plastic. I want to deposit on, plast on, on polymers. I want to deposit... I'm afraid, I, I worry about high temperature because high temperature is usually a reliability problem. If I can deposit on low temperature, it's better. So what usually you do, you put here another electrode. So the silicon is sitting on a conducting holder, and on top of it you put another holder. And then you apply electric field between the two electrodes. This is your substrate, this is your another electrode, and between them you apply electric field. Usually you put here a huge capacitor in series, because you, you want to apply only the AC field, RF, and only the RF field. What happens, I, I, I will go in further details later, but if you apply a strong electric field inside the chamber, you can induce some plasma. What does it mean? Here you have uh, uh, atoms. The atoms are neutral. But even in room temperature, you have a little bit, a very small amount of ions, just because of normal dissociation. And you have a little, some electrons. And if you have some very strong electric field, some of the, if you have very small amount of ions, very small amount, you accelerate them. When you accelerate them, they collide and can ionize other atoms, which are moving and colliding with other atoms, and you can have a chain reaction, like an avalanche, which you introduce plasma. You are generating ions inside the volume. Now, if you take this electric field that at one time it's in this direction, and at another time it's the other direction, essentially you will concentrate, most of the ions will be concentrated in some point in the center, and very little will be concentrated near the electrodes, and I will explain to you why later. But if the ions are, if the electric field is going up and down, up and down, you are not pulling all the electrons, all the ions to one electrode, but you are generating a plasma inside the volume. Now, because you are generating plasma inside the volume, now you have a reactive gas species are formed by reaction in the plasma. And because in the plasma you have very high electron temperature, because the ele now you get uh, energy from the electrodes. So are, the system is not in thermal equilibrium. The electrons are much more energetic. And in the, this is called PECVD system. You create very reactive species. And because of that, the deposition rate becomes faster. Because now the deposition is not from atoms or molecules. The deposition is by, at, by reactive species, by electrically react, by species which are activated by the electric field. Not only by ions, but some of the atoms absorb energy from the field and are being excited, not necessarily ionized. The plasma is still neutral. The plasma here is neutral. We have electrons, E minus, and we have ions which are positive, and the plasma is neutral. It's not charged. But because we have ions and electrons and also some atoms, let's say atom is X, some atoms are excited. They, have, they are being bombarded by other ions and electrons, and their internal energy is higher. That's why they react faster at low temperature. For example, PCVD condition, we induce like argon, uh, many times you mix the gas, the reactive gas, by a noble gas, argon, krypton, 
neon, they are uh, used to uh, excite the plasma, to absorb the energy, to transfer the energy. Uh, the RF bias typically is in the range of a few hundred volts, in some cases up to 1,500. Typical deposition for PCVD is 250 to 400. High temperature reactions can take place on temperature sensible materials. So we can deposit on plastic, we can deposit... Yeah. Now, typical CVD material systems, I showed you in the last lecture, but if we repeat it, in typical in a system, you have oxidation of halides, like uh, SIL, uh, silicon chlor is SiCl4 plus hydrogen plus another very common oxidizing material, NO. Sometimes, uh, in many situations, you don't like oxygen. It's too reactive. So if you want a gas with a good oxidizer, but not so reactive as oxygen, NO is a good candidate. Sometimes NO2 is also a possibility. Sorry? NO, NO. I think NO2 is the love gas. NO is quite toxic, I believe. And then you form SI chlor 4 plus NO, you generate SiO2, N2, and HCl. And this is a process at 1100 degrees, very dense material. Uh, you can also deposit oxide by pyrolysis. SiO, and this is a very common process. Uh, let me, Si, you are not a chemist, you are not familiar with this material, but let me, it's a family of compound, which is silicon, oxygen, and some R, R is some organic group, four times. You know that silicon has four uh, valence electrons, so silicon can connect to four oxygens, and oxygen can connect to organic materials. These compounds are called etoxin compounds, and they have this tendency that if you heat them up, they break and generate oxide, because they have silicon inside and oxygen inside. And what happens, the two molecules react with, with each other. Let's say you have this molecule plus another molecule, CO, CH9, CH, CO, C, to H54, you can have, for example, SiO, SiO from one molecule react with the other molecule, generating SiO, Si, and what's and this component from here and this component from here will go, and we generate some volatile organic material. So th this is a very important material in microelectronics, the epoxy. You can generate a lot of materials from this. It's not only silicon. You can replace the silicon with titanium. You can, can form titanium oxide. A lot of glasses. You can, this, this, this process, this material is used for many, the formation of many glasses. It's very useful in chemistry. We use it to generate the, the, the oxide of a silicon, which is SiO2. It's tetraethyl orthosilicate, or TEOS. This is the official name of this molecule, tetraethyl orthosilicate, or TEOS. The tetraethoxysilan, sorry, I said the wrong name. This is tetraethoxysilan. And uh, it generates very high quality oxide at very high deposition rate. In plasma oxide, when you have SiH4 reacting with N2O reacting SiO2. So, you, for example, you can see three different processes. Each one of them is used to deposit oxide. The first one is, very, is useful to deposit extremely dense oxide, very high quality. The second one is very common to deposit at low temperature on metals. And this one is very common at very, very low temperature, very popular in MEMS and micro-machining, in some nanostructures, then you want to deposit at very low temperature if you don't want to cause any damage. So, CVD of typical material system. Consider a typical reaction, N2 and argon, combination of N2 and argon. 
and you mix it with SiH2, SiH4 and oxygen, you generate SiH2 and H2. Now, important, what are the important variables, for example? This is a common system. Let's discuss a little bit now the position of oxide. What you see here, you have SiH4 over oxide. This is what's important. Now, you can have few options. Let's say that you have a system when you design it with very high surface diffusion. How do you change the surface diffusion? Questions? I, what I'm showing you now, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not telling you how to do it. I'm just telling you, let's assume that my system has very high surface diffusion. What you will have is usually good conformal deposition. Because every atom is deposited, and then it transports on the surface, and then it reacts. Atom is going from the volume, being deposited, transfer, transfer, and react. So if we have very high surface diffusion, we don't care exactly where the atom is coming from. The atoms reach the surface and are diffusing all over. But it's very difficult to get a system with very high surface diffusion because usually the surface diffusion is dominated by adsorption on the surface. And if I have very weak adsorption, then I may affect the whole deposition process. Now, what happens if I start to work in a system and I reduce the pressure? I reduce the pressure, reduce the pressure, reduce the pressure. When I start to reduce the pressure, then, and I reduce the surface diffusion, I care where the molecule is coming from. Here, I'm collecting from 2 pi degrees. Here, I'm collecting uh, with very... Uh, the molecules are coming from all over. Molecule here... If I work at very low pressure, let's say I have a trench, the molecules are coming from all directions, to here, to here, to here, and sometimes are reaching inside. So if you are sitting at the bottom of the trench and you look up into the sky, you are collecting from this uh, part of the sky or from the reactor. If you are here, you are collecting from all 2 pi degrees. So the deposition rate here is slower than the deposition rate here. When does it happen? It happens when the molecules are traveling a long distance before they hit the substrate. This goes at very low pressure when the mean free pass is much longer than the dimension of the features on the wafer. Now, what happens if you take this system and instead of increasing the pressure, you are decreasing the pressure. So the pressure is going up and up and up and up. Now, the molecules are a lot of collisions, a lot of collisions, up they hit the surface. A lot of collisions, a lot of collisions, and up they hit the surface. That's interesting because the corner here is collecting from much larger angle than here. Because from the corner you are collecting from 270 degrees. But here you are collecting only from 180 degrees. So actually, at the corner, the position rate is faster. And you, here at the, here at the bottom, uh, normally you get some deposition, and then you have transport problem inside the chamber, because still you need to transport, uh, the molecule has to diffuse much longer distance. So you get thinner layer at the bottom. So if, you, if I can summarize, you can work at low pressure and high pressure. High pressure, you will usually have some problems at the opening of very narrow features. High pressure, a low pressure, you will have non-uniform deposition that you can solve it by increasing surface diffusion. How to increase surface diffusion? Like increasing temperature. But when you increase the temperature, you increase the, uh, you are, can go to a regime which is dominated by the transport in the volume. So there's always some windows of process or process window which is, depends on the total pressure, substrate temperature, dilutant gas, and the topography. Surface coverage, what I showed you before, 
here on the surface, let's say this is a shoulder. And at the top, you're collecting from 180 degrees. On the sides, you're collecting from 270 degrees. At the bottom, you're collecting from 90 degrees. So what happens if you have, a, a, if, you, if you work, a, you can either have this type of deposition at relatively low temperature, a, sorry, a, at a low pressure, and if you go to higher pressure, you're, you will get this type of deposition of thicker on the sides here. This is how it looks. This is a conformal coating of metal on a chamber. And this is uh, annealing at 1100 degrees Celsius. This is glass. This is SiO2 over polysilicon. This was, there was a polysilicon here before. It actually looks like a hole, and it's actually a hole because it's a very common trick when you make SCM pictures that you etch a little bit the poly. You, you make the cut, then you put it in a special etch on that etch a little bit the poly. It's called delineation or uh, decoration of the feature. It's very common in practice. So actually, it looks like a hole. It's actually a hole in this specific structure. And you can see this is a glass. And the glass, you can put phosphor inside the glass. And phosphor inside the glass introduce another parameter. And this, if you remember, this is 1100 degrees Celsius. So this is way, this is very high temperature. So when you introduce phosphorus, you make the glass softer. And it starts to flow. So this is zero phosphorus. This is 2.2. This is 4.6. This is 7.2 phosphor inside the SiO2. And you can see this is all under exactly the same CVD conditions. Uh, this, by the way, this was very common about 20 years ago. Don't do it anymore. We found now we have other tricks. But I want you to remember this. That I can control the deposition by adding phosphor because phosphor in glass reduce the melting point of the glass, reduce the glass temperature. So not the melting point, the glass temperature, and make it softer. And it flows like a margarine. When you hit a margarine or butter, and it's actually flowing. So let's now, I would like, we have about half an hour till the end of the lecture. So we'll, questions? OK. Adding phosphorus to SiO2 reduces the glass temperature. So if I will take a glass, let's say I will take a SiO2, a piece of glass, and heat it, what happens if I will wait long enough and I will heat it to a temperature which is high enough, this glass will start to flow. And this is the same effect that you put a piece of butter on a, and you start to heat it up. You, you put, detect, you put the, the, the butter and start, it start to flow and until it becomes. Now, this is SiO2. If I will put a little bit of phosphorus inside, I lower the glass temperature. So this flow becomes more, become faster because the glass now flows at lower temperature. So now I will get this process, which is called reflow. Now, reflow is the transport of the, because now the, the material, in this temperature, we, I'm, uh, and the, this experiment was done in turn, intentionally at 1,100 degrees Celsius. So we are above the glass temperature of all the glasses. Uh, remember, the glass temperature of pure SiO2 is about 970, 980 degrees Celsius, approximately, around 1,000. So if I add phosphorus, I will start to have the material is less viscous. and It's actually flowing faster. So this uh, process is called reflow. It's adding dopant to the glass that makes it softer. You can add phosphor, you can add boron, and you can add boron and phosphorus together. 
This is called PSG, if you put phosphorus. If you put boron, it's called BSG. If you put boron and phosphorus, it's called BPSG, boron, phosphorus, silicon glass. It was a very common passivation, I would say, between 1985 and 1990 up to 10 years ago. It's still, people still use it in some processes. Uh, the main problem of this type of uh, passivation is that it has a lot of boron and phosphorus, and you don't want it to go to the silicon. So it might be the problem later of doping, some unwanted doping in your process. But if you do it right, it's, okay, it's working, yes. Won't it add traps to the SiO2? It will absolutely change the electrical properties of the silicon. <laughs> It's definitely, it, it, it actually reduces the break, breakdown field, but on the other hand, it also uh, eliminates a lot of the uh, point defects inside. So it's, it's a very complex system, but it was, it's used in manufacturing. In, in some products, people still use it. So? Can it also be used to eliminate voids? Yes. Sorry? Why, why do you cover the polysilicon with the oxide? This is a typical process. And, and next, you, next, the pro, typical process is that this is the silicon. You oxidize it. You put the gate. Uh, you implant source drain. Then you put an oxide on everything or other passivation. And then you open the contact later. Now, this is, a, I would say, a classical MOS process. Actually, when we discuss real processes in like a few weeks, it's, this is like the basic structure, but the actual structure is much more detailed. So, what do we use SiO2 for? We use SiO2 for interlayer dielectric, for isolation trench field. Isolation trench field, if between transistors, you put oxide. So the transistors or groups of transistors will be isolated. The normal integrated circuit process, the transistors are not always, not everywhere. You have groups of transistors forming cells, gates, XOR, NORs, and or units. And between the, between the cells, between the functional units, you can put isolation to isolate the units between themselves. This is called integrated circuit. This is why we have integrated circuits. We can put many, many transistors. Some of them are the same functional group, but some of them are separate. So you isolate them by dig a hole and fill it with insulator. In process mask, gate the electric, I put here a question mark because today many companies are switching. Instead of using SiO2, they're using hafnium oxide or other high dielectric materials, but still, SiO2 is a common oxide material. Uh, the reactions uh, we have, this is a typical CVD material, SiO2. Uh, as I showed you before, you can use the decomposition of silen, SiH4 plus oxygen. This is a very common material. Uh, it's uh, 300 degrees Celsius to 500 degrees Celsius. Uh, it was very common. It's very quick. It's very cheap. And it's very useful. You can add a phosphine into it and phosphine reacts with oxygen, generating P2O5. And then you have a, what's called a P-glass. Now, this process, the main problem with this process, that it's a surface reaction rate. Uh, uh, it's, it was, it's, uh, it, the, the main problem with this process, it, it's too, sometimes it's too, it's too reactive. So you want to slow it down a little bit. Uh, another process, but this is a very common process at this temperature. Uh, another process is oxidation of halides, uh, as Si chlor 4, for example. This is typically at high temperature. And it's go like this. And the uh, pyrolysis of TOs, which I explained to you before, it's very common because excellent step coverage. And plasma oxide, it's SiH4 plus 2N2O, forming SiO2. So these are it's a repeat of the slide which I showed you before. It's possible processes to deposit SiO2. Yes? When you reach to 1,000 plus degrees, don't you need to leave 
Uh, this this process, I agree, this process is not so useful for integrated circuits because it's too high temperature. It's used if you want to deposit extremely high quality oxide on some substrates. And you don't care much about diffusion because I agree this temperature is a little bit too high. There was very common process that people used for many years. Instead of 1100, they did this deposition at 780. It was very common, uh, I would say, in the 80s, but still it was, it's too high today. Today you don't, you only grow the gate oxide and, uh, or you diffuse the source in the drain and you do it at a very short time and this is it. If you remember what I showed you in the previous lectures, you ion implant the source in the drain and you activate them. And the activation takes a few seconds and this is it. You don't need to go to higher temperature. So the trend today is to run everything, but not at high temperature, it's much lower temperature. Because lower temperature means less defects, more stable process. But I'm showing you the options. What else you can deposit? You can deposit polysilicon. SIH4, this is a common process for polysilicon gate. Uh, you just 100% silen, and then you can get like 10 nanometer per minute and uh, usually you have uh, some problems with nucleation and then you dilute it in nitrogen or hydrogen. And this is a very common problem. Many times when you work with very pure gases, they are adsorbed into the surface. And because they are adsorbed to the surface, they, there are too many atoms in the surface and they interfere with one another and the nucleation process it becomes too slow. So sometimes it's very common that you mix the pure gas with some hydrogen. Hydrogen is a very good tendency. It's a very light atom. makes a very good mixture. Good heat transfer also. And also it adsorbs to the surface and removes very quickly. So it can, it cleans the surface. So, oops, where I was, I was here. Uh, deposition temperature. If you deposit below 575 degrees, you grow amorphous silicon. It's, very, by the way, very common in solar cells. In also in a, what's, what's called very thin film technology. Uh, above 625, it grows like column, columnar structure. I showed it to you last lecture. It like, it's very, uh, the, the crystals are long and like needles collected together. If you grow above 700, it's crystalline. And above 1100, it becomes single crystal if you deposit it on silicon. During the position, you can mix it with diboran, phosphine, and arsenic, so you can grow doped silicon in situ. Now, the silent reaction at silicon surface, the reaction, if you now want to uh, review the polysilicon deposition in light of what we discussed in the last lecture. Imagine you have SiH4, this molecule, Flowing, flowing, adsorbed to the surface. And you also have hydrogen here because this hydrogen can go away. This hydrogen can go away and then you have silicon. The silicon is on the surface now and it can surface diffuse. And it will prefer to grow, to find the deposition on, on a corner. If you have a, a silicon which was deposited previously, it's more the probability of deposition in the corner is higher than the deposition on this wall. Because when the atom goes to a corner, it makes more bonds. So the, there's a net gain in energy. So typical deposition is in kinks and corners and edges. And then you grow this layer. And F2, the deposition rate of the surface, is, depends KCS. F2, the silent flux of the silicon, and you have the surface reaction rate, and CS is the concentration of silen at the silicon surface. So we can apply this to silen. This is a silen reaction. Now, if the temperature is too low, below 575, then the surface diffusion is too slow. So the atom is being deposited and stays, deposited and stays. So you have no orientation. There's no crystalline growth. So the material remains amorphous. It's called amorphous silicon. And amorphous silicon contains a little bit of hydrogen. So in many cases, you sometimes find what we call hydrogenated amorphous silicon. 
Now, polysilicon applications, and this is a cross-section in a real circuit. Now, since some of you are not so much familiar with real circuits, so let me explain it to you. You have a silicon wafer, and on top of it, we grow epitaxial silicon. So this light blue is silicon that was grown epitaxially. And you remember epitaxial silicon, typical deposition is from silicon chlor 4, uh, also mixture with HCl or with hydrogen. Sorry, with hydrogen, mixture with hydrogen. I showed it to you in the last lecture, but if you grow at very high temperature and you grow it on silicon, you will grow epitaxial air. This is a chemical vapor deposition of single crystal silicon. The next, you dop part of the silicon, and if the substrate was p-type, and I can control the doping. When I grow the silicon, I can control the doping. I can, for example, introduce boron. So I will grow p epitaxial silicon. The next, I deposit the N-well. And N-well, the way to deposit N-well is by ion implantation of some phosphorus or arsenic and heat it up to activate the ion and the, uh, the ions. The next step, I define a certain region which I call field oxide. I etch a trench and fill it with oxide by chemical vapor deposition. The actual process, and I will show you to you, it's, um, in, in order to understand the complete process, you need to, there's another lecture on polishing, but let me show you the basic idea. You, let's say this is a trench. You deposit oxide everywhere, and then you polish it. You just put, take the wafer, put it on a polishing pad, and polish it. And when you polish it, you're removing, removing, removing until you, add, you, you end up with a flat surface. No Sorry? No okay, no expense here. Okay. And I'm going to, we're going to have another lecture on, on polishing. Next, now this is called active region. This is called field region. This is called active region. In this field region, we grow the gate oxide, and then we deposit the polysilicon everywhere, and by lithography, we define the polysilicon where we want. So by defining the polysilicon and defining the active region, I define the transistor, because we have gate, we have field, and everything else is the source and the drain. Now the problem, the process is a little bit more complicated. The next step, no, the next step is the following. I have the poly and I have the field here, field oxide. And don't forget, here under the poly we have the very thin gate oxide. The next step is the following. I deposit CVD of insulator everywhere. And I try to deposit a conformal deposition. So I have this structure. The next step is to take this structure and to etch it. Now etching is the opposite of deposition. When you deposit, you react on the surface and you deposit material. Etching is you apply reaction on the surface that instead of depositing, you are etching the material. And you're depositing in a process that it etches from the top uniformly. We don't want a conformal deposition, but a non-conformal deposition. Like, imagine that I etch from the top and I remove a layer, but if I etch, I apply an etchant that removes the surface in this direction. So it does not remove the sides very well. I'm shooting ions to the surface, and they're removing material, and they're removing the material, but in the side here, they're not removing very much. Because the, this ion, when it hits here, it sees this thickness. When it hits here, it sees a very high thickness. So the edge rate here is much, much is different. So I end up with this structure. Ah, I forgot to mention, sorry, I forgot one step. Let's do, one, let's do one step 
I take this structure and implant phosphorus at medium doping, not high doping, at medium doping. Then I form this spacer in the process that I showed you before. I deposit a uniform deposition. I do non-uniform etching. And then I do another ion implantation of very high doping of N plus. So this is, phosphorus is N, phosphorus is N. So I have this structure which is L, called LDD, lightly doped drain. So I have this, the drain and the source and the light, lighter dropped source and drain. So this structure you can see here, this is the polysilicon. In this specific sample, the spacer is made of nitride. That's why this very big N here. And what you see here, this is N plus and N, N and N plus. So this transistor, the source and the drain are lightly doped. And next you put oxide everywhere, this green stuff. And um, you open a contact. Now, there are f some items here which I need uh, to explain. This, this slide actually... I could have shown it to you at the end of the end of the semester, but I'm going to show it to you a few times because you will understand more and more what's going on here. You see, on the top of the polysilicon there is another material which is called tisilicide. And this will, again, this is our next next lecture. But instead of just polysilicon, people put on polysilicon titanium silicide or nickel silicide or another silicide because they have much they are semi metal, they are actually metallic materials and they have much higher conductivity. And then, on the insulator, you deposit, you, you open a hole, and you etch and deposit tungsten. And the tungsten is the contact. Then you put aluminum and tungsten, and this is aluminum and tungsten. This is aluminum technology. This is not current technology. This is older technology. And if you can see the aluminum, which is the blue, is cladded, there is a layer, gray layer here and gray layer here. Typically, this layer is titanium nitride. And the reason, if you remember why we put titanium nitride, it's a bare layer and also to prevent a re reflection from the aluminum. So we use it for lithography, but it's also a barrier layer. It stabilizes the aluminum. There's another material here which is called spin on glass, which I usually don't teach in this class. It's, people don't use it much anymore. But I just just give you an idea what is SOG. People don't use it anymore, but it's an interesting material, SOG, spin on glass. If you take SiOC2H54, or this more generally, silicon oxygen R4. If you look at this molecule, Oxygen, R, O, R, O, R, O, R. And you mix it with water. Water is H, O, H. You can actually generate, a re you have a reaction, R, O, H is coming out. Do you remember what is... Is a chemist in the house. What is a compound which is ROH? It's alcohol. It's a, and this alcohol is coming out. And what you end up with this H here. Now take the same molecule and put them close to each other. What you will have, this material will come out. And what we call this material? H2O is water, and what we will end up with SI, SI, OSI. So this reaction form one SI, OSI bond, but it, this reaction can continue, and the result is glass. So you can take this, you take this uh, molecule, organic molecule, silicon OR, R can be alcohol, methanol, ethanol, propanol, other molecule. 
and you mix them with water, and you shake it, and you form glass. And this is a very common material. Uh, I just want to tell you this material is available. You can buy it in a bottle. It looks like a liquid. It's actually a liquid, sorry. And don't expose it to don't expose it to air. Don't to air. Don't heat it up because this reaction is not in room temperature. You have to heat it up a little bit, like to 50, 300 degrees Celsius. But if you take this liquid and you put it on a substrate and you heat it up, you get glass. So why don't people use it everywhere? The main problem of this glass is that because it evaporates a lot of material outside, it tends to shrink. And because it shrinks, in many cases, you have a lot of defects. So, but still, uh, many companies used it in the past. It was very common material in late 80s and until about 10 years ago. Still, not many people use it. But I want to bring it to your attention that such material is available and maybe you will find an application. Not wrong, but at that time, uh, CVD systems were not, uh, I would say, uh, CVD system, good CVD system were not so much available 15, 20 years ago. And since CVD system improved significantly, there was no much need for spin on glass. Now, polysilicon application. For example, this is a picture of a, a memory. Uh, this is a buried uh, strap trench capacitor. It, here it's for 64 megabit uh, DRAM, but actually people use it the same technology now for much denser structures. And what you see here, is this is tungsten bit line, and this is the polysilicon stud. A uh, stud is like a... like a big piece of uh, polysilicon connecting this part of this part. And what you have here, this is polysilicon connected with tungsten silicide with a coating. And uh, if you are not so much familiar with DRAMs, in DRAM, what you have is a transistor connected to a capacitor. This is a cell of a DRAM. And this is one line, and this is the second line. So by applying here one and one logical one, you are charging the, put the information on this capacitor. So read, uh, a DRAM is basically charged, it's a capacitor connected to a switch. So what you have here, this is the capacitor. What people usually do, they dig a very deep trench, etch a very deep trench inside the silicon, coat it with a very, very thin oxide on the side, and fill it with polysilicon. So you have a capacitor which is silicon, oxide, polysilicon. Now the substrate, this is this capacitor. The, 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 the substrate is the ground, and the top of the capacitor is connected to the transistor, which is this transistor. And the transistor is connected to another cell, which we don't care very much, so this is one cell. One cell is one transistor and one capacitor. And if you can count here that you put here silicon nitride, which you deposit by CVD. You put a tungsten silicide that you deposit by CVD. You have polysilicon deposited by CVD. So there's a lot of CVD process. Uh, here you have an oxide uh, collar, which is a very thin oxide in the bottom. On the top you put a thicker oxide because of reliability issue. So this is a cell. Now CVD of polysilicon, LPCVD, is typically silen going to silicon. The process is typically low pressure, and this is typical deposition conditions. Typical in a hot wall furnace, it's economical, uniform, pure process. You can do in situ doping, and application is gate electrode and trench capacitor. This is poly poly polysilicon CVD. And uh, the typical process of polysilicon CVD is SIH4 deposition on the surface. Typically, you break it by in a two-step. It's not a four, typically, it's not a four-step process, but a two-step process. And it's a, still, a, not debate, but it's a, it was a lot of experiments until people figure out you lose hi, two hydrogens, then you lose two more hydrogen, and then you have deposition of silicon on the surface. 
And this is polysilicon deep deposition. Uh, you can also have a silicon dichlorosilan. Initially, you lose to hydrogen, then you lose to, uh, to, to chlorines, and then you lose, uh, you lose the hydrogen, lose the chlorine, and, the, uh, and on the surface, you lose the hydrogen in the volume and the adsorption if a silicon with two chlorine, and then you lose the two chlorines and you have this deposition on the surface. Um, what happens if you, during CVD process, add dopants? Let's skip this class. This is, for example, this is doped polysilicon uh, resistivity. A typical resistivity of polysilicon when you deposit it, this is the position versus temperature. This is the, if you deposit at very high temperature, this is, this is a typical deposition. Typical deposition of polysilicon is 10 to the minus 3, a few times 10 to the minus 3, a little less than 10 to the minus 3, in units of ohm centimeter. And I want you to remember that the uh, resistivity of metals, of copper, is 1.8 10 to the minus 6, and aluminum is about 3 10 to the minus 6. So polysilicon resistivity is 10 to the minus 3. It's good resistivity, but still uh, metals are three orders of magnitude better. Now, this is, dop this is doped polysilicon when you put the metal, put the doping by diffusion. If you put the dopant by ion implantation, you depend on the concentration of the implant. And uh, this is the concentration of the phosphorus translated to per unit volume. So it's not per unit area, it's per unit volume. And what you can see that if you, the doping is too, not good enough, you get high resistivity. If it's, you go to 10 to the 20, then you get very uh, low doping. It's uh, still not as good as diffusion, but it's okay. Now, if you put uh, adds during deposition, you add some phosphorus. Uh, if you deposit at 600, 700, 800, uh, and you reach this value of about 1 million centimeter. So there are three mechanisms to dope polysilicon. Either by diffusion, which you grow the polysilicon and diffuse phosphorus into it from the gas phase or from other source, or you do uh, ion implantation, or in situ. I mean, you grow, uh, you, you insert phosphine inside the process while you grow the polysilicon. Uh, I'd skip the, poly, uh, the typ typical annealing and move to the, uh, and now I want in the next 15 minutes before we go to cover some basic material. Nitrides. Nitrides are grown by SiH4 and ammonia, or SiH4 and, and uh, <coughs> nitrogen in the plasma. And it's a silicon nitride has a low H rate in HF, and usually has problem with stress. Uh, it's a very good barrier, excellent barrier, but very high internal stress. So it's very difficult to grow thick layers of nitride, but it's very useful in very thin layers. Uh, typical system, silicon and ammonia, and I will skip the details here and go to the application. Silicon nitride, it's very common in self-aligned contact, edge stop layer. Silicon nitride at all is a material which is a very good edge stop because it has relatively lower edge rate than oxide. So in many cases, you want to etch oxide, and you want to stop in a certain depth. Now, there are two ways, when we discuss etching, there are two ways to design a process. You want to know when to stop. You want to etch, 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 until you, you want to stop etching. So one way is called timed etching. You know, I will etch one minute and then stop. I don't care. Another option is to measure during the etching uh, by some other method, uh, am I in the right place or not? And the third method is to bury some nitride when you grow the layers. For example, imagine, I'm, I'm using an imaginary process. I have a layer, and I put oxide, and here I put a nitride, and then I put another oxide on top. And when I etch in this region, I etch, 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 and then I hit the nitride and I stop. In this region, I will continue the etching until 
I don't know what. I can put another layer of nitride here and stop here. So edge stop is a technique where you bury inside your structure some other metal or other material, like nitride, and you stop on that layer. And it's a very good technique. It's, it's more complicated because you need to deposit the nitride. It costs money. It takes some process. But when you do the etching, you know where you stop. So it's, and you can stop everywhere on the same wafer. So this process, uh, you use the nitride for uh, edge stop layer. Uh, for example, here, if you put poly and oxide on top of it, and you put on the nitride a very thin layer of nitride. Now, why this is important? Because in this step, for example, what happens if I etch this yellow stuff, but somehow I have some misalignment. It's, uh, it's not in the right place. And I etching, instead of etching here, I'm etching here. So because I put this edge stop at the bottom, I don't care if I etch, I don't care if I etch the bottom. Because I have here a protection layer. Uh, this is the edge stop layer for the spacers. Also, very common today is to what we call hard mask. It's an, many companies, you, don't, people, you will find out that people call the silicon nitride layer hard mask. But it's the same. It's a layer that you put on silicide to prevent overetching of silicide, to protect the metal. It's a protection layer. Silicon nitride is a very dense material, very stable material, and usually with very low etch rate. Also, people use it in shallow trench isolation as a protection layer. Now, the, I took this from Applied Material Database. Now, very, it's a very common process. You find it in many steps. There's one drawback to this process. Silicon nitride has a very high dielectric constant, between 7 to 8, twice than oxide. That's why it increases the capacitance. It, it, it increases the parasitic capacitance. And uh, if you don't, care, if you don't uh, pay attention too much to the stress in silicon nitride, this is what you get. This is a silicon layer. This is a, a picture of a wafer that we deposited silicon nitride on top of it and deposited and deposited until the layer became too thick and the stress was too high and this was the result of it. This is not good. But this is what happens when the stress is too high. Simply the layers break, buckle, falling apart, fall apart. Now CVD of metals, you can deposit, I showed you the positive of tungsten. Uh, CVD tungsten is widely employed in a variety of applications. Uh, WF6 with silen. Uh, you can deposit uh, titanium nitride uh, of, over all surfaces. You can deposit uh, titanitride. Uh, sorry, this is uh, usually you can deposit on titanxin, on titanitride, so you get very good deposition on this layer. Uh, you can have a selective deposition, WF6 plus an argon mixture on silicon can be deposited only on silicon, and this is deposition at high temperature. Oh, another process which is very common is CVD of copper. Now tungsten CVD is a very common process for tungsten today for all processes, both for aluminum processes and copper processes. This is the most common process for contacts, not for the lines, but for the contacts. And the reason, if you etch a trench and deposit here this passivation of tinitride, we call it a liner. This is another name for a very thin layer to deposit metal on top of it. You can very easily deposit tungsten inside this trench. And there are a few mechanisms. One mechanism is to take this process and the deposit tungsten everywhere and then polish and this is what you get and then you put another layer on top of it and you can put a second metal on top of it can be aluminum can be copper and this is a very basic process to make a contact a via contact uh, precursors are can be wf6 is the most common today but you can also use w chlor 6 
you can use this solid source also and the tungsten deposition use WF6 is very sensitive to the wafer surface material you always have this nucleation issue and people are still investigating this it's not over yet it's not that everything is understood in this process you get faster nucleation on metal and conducting surfaces and usually typically bad nucleation and adhesion to insulators you use it that's why you need a liner for blanket deposition and you got selective deposition mode is possible typical reactions are I'm not going to show it today but there are many possible reactions of tungsten and typical properties of typical uh, via or interconnect is 500 to 350 nanometer resistivity of CVD tungsten is 10 11 12 which is much worse than aluminum than copper. That's why tungsten is usually used for only the contacts, not for the interconnect themselves. Uh, it's not so reflective, which is good. Stress is uh, 1.52 gigapascal. It's relatively high stress in the film. And the step coverage is, look at the numbers, 90%, which is usually very good step coverage. It's very conformal deposition. And uh, this is sheet resistance uniformity. So this is a, a very, this is the common. Uh, this is the blank and tungsten deposition. You can also, you can also, there are some processes called selective processes that you get deposition only here. But I, we focus on this process. Now, sorry, questions? Yeah. Running too fast? So, the what? Blanket. Yes. This is, but this is about at six, it's a 400 degrees or 600 degrees blanket. It's a little hot blanket. <laughs> I will. Uh, uh, the value is like how much you deposit on the side relative to how much you deposit on the top. This is how it looks, by the way. Selective. This is what you see here is the uh, vias of tungsten looks like uh, this is tungsten tungsten CVD inside oxide and uh, this is uh, from the top and this is when the side when you can see it from the sides looks like <coughs> cupcakes you know. it's very it's very good with the blanket to have a cupcake <laughs> sorry you need to polish it last is copper CVD and again copper CVD I bring you as a reference it's uh, I will skip it in this lecture Please read it in the notebooks. I'm not going to give it in class. And one of the reasons is that it's not so common. People now use electroplating. But I want just to bring to your attention, we have slides on, on copper CVD and the mechanisms and lectures on tinitrate CVD. Please look at it as the, at the process. Uh, and uh, I'll stop here because this is exactly what we start in the next lecture. In the next lecture, we start plasmas, because plasma is the introduction to understand PVD. Because PVD, we discuss from sputtering, and we need to understand plasmas. From next lecture, we discuss plasma, and please stay warm. <laughs>